okay uh, uh, good evening everybody welcome to the uh, symposium on artificial intelligence this is the second of the uh, month series of the four week series which we are having so in this session we will have two talks one is on the different artificial intelligence approaches in glaucoma so this talk will be given by dr brian m williams from the lancaster university who has worked closely with our uh, uh, collaborator dr gabriella in uh, artificial intelligence work related to glaucoma and we'll also have gabriella talk to us about the pros and cons of the different approaches in artificial intelligence we all know it's not a straightforward uh, uh, application in when it comes to glaucoma because there are so many factors involved both related uh, to uh, optic nerve head oct visual fields intraocular pressure family and lot of things which are involved in approaches to glaucoma so it's kind of a more complex than the straightforward diabetic retinopathy so it will be interesting to know what are all the different approaches and also to understand the pros and cons of these different approaches uh, brian you will start the talk for the next 20 25 minutes Thank you. So, um, yes, yeah, so it's a really interesting topic to be discussing at the moment. It's very current to, to discuss the AI in healthcare. So today we're focusing more on glaucoma, which, um, as you said, is a very complex um, disease to diagnose given the numbers of different methodologies you need um, in clinic. Okay. So the outline of my talk, so um, I'll give some focus to image processing, which is my particular field, um, and a brief introduction to glaucoma and its diagnosis uh, before we start talking about the automated diagnosis procedures, which draw heavily on image processing, um, and finish with some of the challenges and the possibilities that we have. Okay, so for those of you who uh, don't know the UK maybe so well, so this session's been organized partly with uh, JMU, uh, so I'm based, um, I'm an honorary lecturer at Liverpool University, and I work at Liverpool Royal Hospital. But I'm based primarily up at Lancaster University, which is about 50, 60 miles away, um, up near the Lake District. Okay, so as I said, my focus is much more on image processing in artificial intelligence. So when I say image processing, we tend to, I tend to think about um, some different areas. So medical imaging is a primary focus. So we might start to think about um, if we're given an image, what kind of information can we take out of it and abstract from it that could be useful for making a decision? So on the left-hand side here, we've got, uh, we've got some angiography where we're seeing a nice image of the blood vessels. Maybe we want to identify wh which parts of that image are actually a blood vessel. Maybe we want to measure them for some reason. Um, to locate a blockage. Uh, and on the right hand side, we've got a high resolution OCT image of the cornea. So in this case, we might want to measure thickness. So I'm showing here some the central thickness measurement of the stroma. Um, so in terms of what a human can achieve and what a computer can achieve, it's quite reasonable to expect a human to maybe click on two points and try to calculate the thickness. But to expect a human to calculate the thickness of the overall cornea is a lot to ask. So this is where artificial intelligence really comes in to help. So some other um, areas that we work in would be security, where we're trying to, um, so everybody's familiar with facial recognition. One key thing we're trying to do is again, identify blood vessels, um, this time in the hand. And there's many other applications that come into play uh, in industry. Um, so in pharmaceuticals, trying to measure the film coating on tablets, for example or I think most people know the concept of having self-driving or driver-assisted cars, where we want to be able to localize and identify regions, um, objects that might be in the way. So we're focusing on medical imaging today. Um, so I tend to split medical imaging or image processing in medical imaging into three different categories. So you've got image processing and analysis. So this is all at the ground level with an image where we're starting to take this really complex data that we have contained in an image and all of this textural information, 
and we're trying to, to localize this information, we're trying to uh, extract it, um, and then we want to take some meaningful thing from that. So maybe it's a, a measurement of an optic disc, um, or it's the size of, uh, size of a pathology. And then we extend from that into diagnostics. So this is ultimately, what do we do with this information? So a lot of our work is tending towards trying to find um, to find out how we can diagnose a disease automatically or semi-automatically. And then as a final, um, a final topic is device development. So this is combining technology and software to try to get more sensitive diagnostics or more sensitive analysis of tissue. So in image processing and analysis, one of the key things that we're looking at is image enhancement as well. So it's all about trying to draw out as much information as we can possibly get from an existing imaging modality, and then to try to use that somehow to build a diagnosis tool that's maybe cheaper, is maybe faster, um, and can maybe cope with a more higher for, with a higher demand than clinicians um, might be able to. And in terms of device development, we're usually looking to achieve something that, that really where really we've reached the current limitations of existing devices. So glaucoma. Um, so glaucoma tends to manifest itself as peripheral vision loss, meaning that you lose the vision um, in the periphery on the, on the outside and hopefully retain at least your central vision. It is one of the commonest causes of blindness and a crucial thing that um, is, is common across many ophthalmic diseases that I find people are often surprised about is that there are no early symptoms. So that means there's damage being done behind the scenes and the patient does not know about it. And people tend to be quite surprised um, by that concept because they tend to think if it's your vision, then surely if something's going wrong, you're going to know about it. And the real problem with glaucoma is that once this damage has happened, it can be irreversible. So I think it's the leading cause of irreversible blindness in the world. So what we want to do ultimately with glaucoma is we want to be able to diagnose it faster, and we want to be able to diagnose it earlier. Okay, so as I said, it's the second leading cause of blindness in the UK, the leading cause of irreversible blindness, and it's actually responsible for a huge amount of hospital activity, um, either through prevalence or through um, incorrect referral. So that's another issue that we try to task tackle with artificial intelligence is to say, if we go out to say primary care where maybe it's a bit more difficult to diagnose glaucoma because they don't have the methodology, they don't have the tools to do it um, effectively, can we get a more accurate diagnosis and avoid the patients, have any, and avoid healthy patients being sent into the hospital and try to reduce some of the burden? Okay, so glaucoma, it typically affects the optic disc so this makes the optic disc, of course, a critical site for investigation. So the top two images that I'm showing here are images of the optic disc. So you can see, if you can see my mouse pointer, um, where I'm drawing a boundary around this region here is the optic disc. And the challenge is we want to have a look at this um, and see if we can try to automatically abstract this information um, that's contained in here that's going to help to tell us whether this patient is healthy or whether this is a glaucomatous patient that we're looking at. And that's a difficult task, even for a human to do. Um, so as was mentioned earlier, we're not just looking. So this is a, a fundus image, um, a fundus photography image of the optic disc. And typically, we're not just looking at this kind of image. But if we focus on this for a while, um, you'll note just in this small selection of examples, what we've got is a huge amount of variability in the optic disc size, in the optic disc shape, um, in this bright region in the center, which is the optic cup, which is a crucial area for measurement. Um, it's quite difficult, it's very subjective to actually identify the boundaries of this region, which is one of the key markers. So all in all, when it comes to a human, this image is actually extremely challenging to interpret. And when it comes to a computer, you've then got the issue that you're trying to, to go a step further and enable a computer to understand something that a human is finding hard. Okay. So this is why we have this uh, whole raft of, uh, of uh, diagnostic tools that come into play. 
So we've got stereoscopic imaging um, where clinicians can put on their, their 3D vision goggles to try to get an understanding of the 3D profile of the optic disc. We've got on the right an OCT. So uh, we've got a tomographic image of the optic disc where we can look at the, maybe the thickness of the nerve fiber layer and we can identify the drop off a bit more accurately. Um, on the bottom, we've got a visual fields test, which we happen to know patients don't like very much. Um, so if we look at the image on the bottom left, what we're seeing is the darker regions are the regions where the patient is starting to lose their vision. So you can see on the right, um, all of the dark regions are in the periphery. So this would suggest that the patient is suffering from peripheral vision loss, um, which would suggest glaucoma. Um, so what we'd want to do is to take all of these things and combine them. So in the UK, we've got well, at Liverpool, we've got this concept of virtual clinics. So the idea is that in order to try to save clinician time, the patient comes into the hospital for their scan and they'll meet with a tech an imaging technician. So the technician will use the devices to take a scan of their eye. Um, that scan will go up to a reading center and uh, really expert graders will be able to take a look at this image and try to, to, to get an understanding of what's happening with the patient and maybe give a preliminary diagnosis. Okay. So still focusing on like the optic disc, of course. So one of the key things that we look at is this region here. So the outer circle that I've drawn out is the optic disc and the inner circle is the optic cup and then that leaves us with the neuroretinal rim. And really what graders have time to look at is what's known as the cup to disc ratio. So this means we take the upper and lower boundaries of the cup height, the upper and lower boundaries of the disc height, we find the ratio of that. And if it is, if this ratio goes beyond a certain value, then is maybe suspected glaucoma. If it's less than a certain value, then maybe the patient's healthy. So it's actually quite a useful um, marker of glaucoma. And it's one that can be reasonably quickly identified. So the way it happens in the UK is that the grader will click on these two points um, in order to get a pixel-wise measurement of it that's computed automatically. And that will give them um, the cup to disc ratio that they will base um, their judgment on. So a question we might ask when it comes to, to automated diagnosis initially is let's try and follow what the clinicians are doing, what the graders are doing maybe we can try to identify these uh, points automatically and we can give this cup to disc ratio for them on thousands of images without anybody having to click anything. That's going to speed things up and it's going to reduce a considerable burden on graders. So how might we try to do that? Well, there's a couple of approaches that we can consider. There's lots of imaging approaches that we can consider, in fact, to try to localize these points. So there's the concepts of filtering and looking at texture and local properties. So this means we're looking at the overall image and we're trying to identify in the minutiae of the image exactly what does this region look like compared to the rest of the image. And if we can narrow this down to a specific patterning or a specific type of pattern, then maybe we can locate this image robustly and automatically. Um, so texture falls into that same concept. Variational modeling is where we'll try to describe the location with an equation. So we'll write some sort of equation that describes what does this region look like. And it may be in terms of gradients, um, it may involve filters and texture, but it will ultimately be a trade-off, which helps to make the model just that little bit more robust to different patients, to different um, scenarios. And that generally leaves us with a set of partial differential equations that we try to solve. More recently, we'll look more into machine learning, um, which is largely about abstraction. So what we're trying to do here is compare a huge number of similar profiles in order to get an overall view of what these regions look like. So the key advantage to methods like machine learning, um, certainly in contrast to, to variational modeling, say, is that they can be done incredibly fast. So there's, you split it into two different portions. You have a training portion where you're trying to understand this kind of texture, and that takes a lot of time. But when it comes to actually taking an image that you want to evaluate to identify these points, that can be reduced to a matter of seconds or fractions of a second. And there's a couple of questions that we may well ask when it comes to this kind of piecewise attempt where we're trying to find an intermittent stage of say identifying these points. So the first and one of the most important questions 
is how well can we actually identify these points? And secondly, how robust is this approach? So is this approach going to continue to work for the next patient or for the next 100 patients, or will it only work this one time? That is a really important question. And then one big issue, once we've, all, we've sorted all of that out, and we've actually got a robust model, is that we then look into the efficacy of using that and the, the usefulness of using that. Um, and what we found on data sets is that um, the accuracy of using such a measure in, in diagnosing glaucoma gets an accuracy in the region of, this is quite low, but in the region of 65 to 75%. <clears throat> and an area on the curve of 0.7, which says that on its own, this value is not necessarily very useful and it's not necessarily very robust for diagnosing glaucoma, which is understandable because this is a technique that graders use as a marker. It's not supposed to stand on its own. Okay. And you can see that even more when you start to look at what other features are actually used to diagnose glaucoma. Nobody looks at the vertical cup to disc ratio and says, aha, I've got it. So you'll start to look at other things. You'll look at notches, which are a good indicator of glaucoma. You'll look at peripheral atrophy, um, the, IST, the ISNT rule. Um, so the, the ISNT rule um, is, is, uh, pertains to thinning in different regions of the optic disc. So that in itself says that the vertical cup to disc ratio by itself is going to be useful, um, but certainly not sufficient. And there are other factors like disc size that we can bring in. So what all of this points to is saying that, okay, localizing individual points and trying to make a decision based on these really is not going to be enough. What we need to do is to come out of this and we need to try to gain some understanding of this really complex data that we've got. Um, and there are two ways that we can do that. We can go for an abstract approach um, where we're we going to, to define a certain feature space, a certain vector set, um, of maybe 1 million, maybe 10 million parameters that we say or that we believe will describe this image. And then we're going to try to make a decision based on that. So the most common technique that uh, most people have heard of these days is convolutional neural networks. Um, so convolutional neural networks are based on building this kind of architecture where you have convolution layers in particular. So convolution layers are all about trying to understand what's going on in the image. And this is where you define your weightings that are going to describe the image. So the concept is that you have this really abstract, abstract notion um, of what the optic disc looks like when this patient has glaucoma. So this is a training and testing approach. Um, so the idea is you've got a lot of patients with glaucoma, a lot of patients who don't, and you train the computer to identify what all of these millions of abstract parameters should be in order to get a diagnosis. The benefits of this, of course, is very fast and it can be extremely accurate, but you have a crucial trust issue. Um, so the, one of the most commonly accepted um, issues with convolutional neural networks, particularly in the medical context, is they are considered black box approaches. Um, and even though there's a lot of effort into it to um, understanding what's going on and trying to find some sort of an interpretability and explainability in these methods, it's still perhaps not quite at the stage that clinicians are ready to accept it. So another, the second approach is to try to do it in a more semantic way, a more meaningful way, um, in a sense. So that means trying to locate features that we know should be relevant and then try to combine those in, an, uh, in, in a, a useful way um, that clinicians may not be able to do by themselves. So in this case, we might try to look at the location of the fovea and the optic disc. What that's going to do is allow us to zoom in on the optic disc. We might use the fovea to get some idea of scale and orientation. After that, we could try to extract the optic disc region and then to segment the boundaries of it. Okay. So this is um, one technique. So this is using uh, a particular neural network um, to try to identify the specific region of the optic disc and the fovea. And we can do this to reasonable accuracy. So we're getting well over 
accuracy in identifying these regions. But what we have to bear in mind is that this should be sufficiently robust for our application. Okay, so it may not need to be 100%, but it needs to be sufficient that if this happens to go wrong, it is not going to impact in a huge way what we do next. Okay. And then after that, once we can zoom in, once we've got our orientation, we can start to segment these boundaries. So in these images, what we're showing in the green, so these are lots of examples. In the green, you can see an expert annotation, and in the blue, you can see some comparison. So by doing it in this way, what we can get is a pretty good representation of the optic disc and cup. And these are still areas that we're interested in. So you'll notice that a few of these have just the optic disc outlined, they don't have the optic cup outlined, which really highlights one of the crucial problems that we've got is in the machine learning world is of having the data. So there's many data sets that exist, um, but not, ne not necessarily all of them include annotations that you would need to uh, understand these patterns. And in particular, I think Drions and OHN, o ONHSD, um, include partial annotations. So they include the optic disc, but they don't include the optic cup. And this is one major limitation that we try to deal with um, in machine learning. So in doing it this way, we can still identify, so based on this segmentation, we can still identify cup height and disc height. We can still try and use this. Um, and this is, if we have a look at the mean accuracy in terms of diagnosing glaucoma with the cup to disc ratio, we've got a very high accuracy of 93%. But we have to remember that this is not necessarily that useful. So since we've got the segmentations of the overall profile, why don't we use it? So why don't we take the overall profile and try to use this information? Now, this is not something that you can expect a clinician to do. It doesn't make sense to expect a clinician to try to estimate the cup to disc ratio or to spend time calculating it. So we might try to do it automatically. Also, if we look at extracting this cup to disc ratio by sight, you can't really see what's going on there. If we have a look at it in a different orientation in terms of polar coordinates, which we've got here, then you're starting to see something. And this is one of the powers of artificial intelligence is that you can, you can develop different ways of understanding the data and representing the data that is meaningful. So you see in the healthy case here, we've got two peaks. In the glaucoma, we've got one peak. So great, that is a really great find. And it looks like it might be useful until you plot a lot of them from a series of experiments. So this is all from one data set, is all from the same type of population. And the second graph, what we're seeing here is in the blue, we've got glaucomatous profiles. In the red, we've got healthy ones. And again, we've gone back to the issue where it's quite difficult to see what's going on. So what we'd want to do from that is try to develop a more advanced way of calculating this automatically. So our approach, I won't tell too many details because Gabriella is going to give more detail about this in a few moments. Um, but our approach was to develop the statistical model for comparing these profiles. And what we're able to do then is find some way to partition the healthy away from the glaucoma. So it's characterizing in very minute detail these profiles. And if we do that, and we do all of our other stuff too, segmenting the optic disc, characterizing the profiles, we turn that 66% accuracy for diagnosing glaucoma into 92.9% accuracy, and we've since improved on it further. Okay, so there's many key challenges that we face. So I've mentioned a couple already. Um, so data security um, is one, I won't go through all of them. Um, so real world data is a key issue. So you've always got to try to be prepared for any new situation that's going to arise. And I think in medical imaging in particular, adoption is one of the crucial issues. So if we, if we try to implement, for example, uh, a, a technique that's considered completely black box, um, then not too many patients and not too many clinicians are going to be too interested in using it because you have to be able to explain what's going on. And this is something that we try to, we try to address by doing segmentation. So by looking at the optic disc, what we can say is if this is a surprising glaucoma diagnosis, we can always come back a step. We can always come back to the segmentation, to the profile, and we can say, this is why um, this decision was made, which if you've got an end-to-end -end classifier approach, is very difficult to do that. 
And if we can achieve all of this and we can solve all these problems, the key aim that we want is for a faster and earlier diagnosis um, so that we can spot this damage as it's, as it's happening before the symptoms occur. What we can also do, a key, a key thing, is to try to get this kind of technology out into primary care, so into the opticians, where they don't have the methodology um, or necessarily the knowledge um, to try to, to, to diagnose glaucoma from, say, a fundus image, um, and into developing nations that may not have the resources to do that. And if we can do it in a transparent way, then we've got far more chance of this actually being used. Okay. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, I'll pass you over to Gabriella, who is going to tell you a bit more about um, our spatial approach and the pros and cons of using AI. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, Gabriella, we can have your talk. And uh, uh, if anybody has got any uh, questions, you can put it on the chat box. We can take that at the end of both the talks. Yes, Gabriella. Thank you. Can I share the screen? Yeah. Um, sure. Yeah. Okay. Can you see the screen now? Can yes, you see sir. the Yes, yeah, fantastic. Good. Thank you very much. Um, so in this talk, I will talk about a little bit more details on the algorithm that uh, Brian mentioned uh, that we did in Liverpool. And then I will also discuss uh, two main principled types of algorithms for glaucoma when you are using color fundus photographs. And uh, I will conclude with a discussion. So uh, the work that Brian mentioned is a work that we published in PLOS One in January 2019. It was a very exciting uh, work where we had Brian Williams uh, as one of the mathematicians and also Yalin Zeng and Kunli Baida Al Bander and Silas Cezanner who were looking into how to do the segmentations of images and how to understand how to segment out the cup and disc and also how we go further into detecting which patient has glaucoma and which doesn't. We also had clinicians in McCormick, Rob Chisman, Colin Willoughby and also uh, Emery Brown from Neuroscience and George Spieth looking into uh, how to best to write the paper so that the audience understands how this can potentially be used in practice. Um, so this is just to give you a feedback on how such a collaboration was uh, working. Um, so the, the main thing that Brian mentioned was um, the difficulty of segmenting the cup and disc and specifically the cup, which I didn't understand when I started that this is actually such a big problem, but it is. And what we mean by the word segmentation is to identify where the boundaries of these two important features are, the boundary of the cup and also boundary of the disc. So whenever we say the word segmentation of optic nerve head or segmentation of cup and disc, we mean a way of finding out where their boundaries are. And this can be done either manually, like here, I manually did it using these pink curves, they are quite wobbly, so not very good. And then also here, the pink one, uh, sorry, the green one here, that's the one that uh, Brian and the group around Brian did with um, their AI part of the algorithm, the deep learning algorithm. And the blue curves here, this was done, um, this was provided by the Origa authors, Origa dataset authors. And this is what we called semi automated or semi-automatic segmentation where they had clinicians to, or graders to click on several pixels of the image, pixels that they believe belong to the boundary of cup. And then they had algorithm 
that would automatically fit the best fitting ellipse around those points. Of course, we don't see those points, we just see the ellipse. So that's why the blue curves are so beautifully smooth because they are ellipses. So that's what we mean by segmentation. And I do realize that when I sometimes talk to ophthalmologists here in UK, sometimes they, they actually don't understand what I mean by the word segmentation. So that's what we mean, a method of knowing where the boundaries are. So uh, as Brian mentioned, the current practice of um, figuring out whether there is a potentially glaucoma is to find the height of the disc and height of the cup and calculate the cup to disc ratio, the vertical cup to disc ratio. And it is done vertically because typically when the deformation starts, it's happening vertically. And if that number is very high, maybe above 0.7, that there is more of a likelihood that there is glaucoma. But this is, as Brian said, this has only accuracy of around between 60 to 70%. So what we did um, and what Brian started talking about is we actually um, worked on a six step, six step approach, where in step one, um, they, seg they found an automated way of segmenting cup and disc. Then in step two, um, we extracted some useful features, those uh, curves that Brian showed you. And then in step three, uh, rather than using directly the features, we tried to understand them. We saw that in glaucoma, those curves, they would have two humps. So we tried to model them and we quantified the deformation. Then in step five, we figured how to use this deformation to confirm association with whether it is glaucoma or not. And in, then in step six, we then derive the discrimination rule. So if a new patient arrives, um, uh, what is the probability that the eye has glaucoma given a particular deformation of the optic nerve head? So rather than looking at just vertical cup to disc ratio, uh, we looked at the cup to disc ratio in all degrees around, but rather than using all 360, we only use every 15 degrees, so 24 points all around. So each time we would look at the center, we see um, how many pixels there are from the center to the edge of the cup, and also from the center to the edge of the disc, and we calculate the ratio, and we do it 24 times. So these are the curves that Brian showed you, and what we what you see on the top is a typical healthy eye or healthy optic nerve head. And uh, here are all the ratios, the 24 ratios, but it's hard to see, hard to understand um, whether there is a formation or not. But then when you plot it, you see two beautiful humps. And that's because this is an ellipse. But then this is an optic nerve head where there is a glaucoma and there is a narrowing here at the top that's quite visible, but then it's hard to see it in this uh, part of the image F. But when we plot it in um, Cartesian system, where in, on X axis, you have values from zero to 360 degrees. And on Y axis, you have the particular cup to disc ratio and you start from um, inner area. Then what you see that these cup to disc ratios, they start to go up and they go down. So there is only one hump and that would be a sign of a deformation. And in fact, when we look at all the images, all the healthy ones, we saw that typically what you're looking at here, for example, is uh, around 400 healthy eyes and each of them has this blue profile of 24 numbers and they are connected for visualization. So we can see that all of them have these two nice humps Whereas for glaucoma, there may be only one hump or, or the hump completely disappears. What we also see is that these red profiles of these 150 eyes, these red profiles are slightly higher, but there is still a, quite a big overlap with the blue profiles of the healthy eyes. So it's naturally natural from here to see that it's hard to distinguish whether there is glaucoma or not just based on the size of these uh, cup to disc ratios. What we need to look is at the shape of the whole profile. And um, what you see here, the light blue is the average 
profile and here the yellow is also average profile which is quite flat okay so um, rather than using these profiles of 24 numbers directly into classification uh, we decided to model them I also call them extracted features because that's what they are. They are extracted 24 values from the image of millions of pixels. Uh, now we have just 24 numbers for each image of the optic nerve head. So how do we model them? To model them means uh, to find a mathematical model which would uh, naturally describe this increasing hump and then going down and again up and then down. So a model should be, for example, an ellipse, right? Um, and then how do we go from model into prediction? Well, I would use a very simple example like this. When you have a data, a very simple data like this, which, where you have 26 people and for each person you only have two values, not 24, but only two, and that would be weight and height. You can now somehow describe this relationship between weight and height by fitting the line, which is the linear regression, okay? And then you can also say, yes, there is the slope is significant. You can look at the p-value. If the p-value is less than 0.05, you confirm significance. So you say there is a association between weight and height, and it can be to some extent described by linear line. Um, but we can go actually further. We can now say, well, can you actually use it to predict height for a particular weight? And yes, we can. We can just look at the height, uh, weight of a person who has 70, kilograms and you just go up to the line and down to the left and you see what is the height the predicted height is around 170 centimeters okay and there is also some precision to that which depends on how much these dots vary around the orange line so this is exactly what uh, we did with glaucoma and that is we first modeled the relationship between having or not having glaucoma so that would be the height was replaced by, by variable having or not having glaucoma, 0, 1, okay, only dichotomous, and the weight would be replaced by those 24 numbers. But of course, I cannot plot it on a two-dimensional plot anymore, but you just need to take my word for it. Um, so this is the model, and the model turned out to have only uh, 12 parameters in it. The parameter that would tell me how much, on average, the profiles of glaucoma um, profiles, how much the average is higher than the average of non-glaucoma. And then here there are eight parameters to describe the ellipse. They turned out to be exactly eight. Um, we use some information criteria from statistics machine learning that tells us how to find the best parsimonious model so we don't overfit. And that was exactly eight parameters. Then here is the parameter di, which is a random variable. And this variable constitutes some inherent um, genetic properties of each person because each person is born with a different size optic nerve head or optic disc. Some people are born with bigger discs, some people with smaller. We did not know what is the height in these images because we did not have this information, but we still assumed in the model that there is such a thing and we assume that this is drawn from some normal distribution and this then introduces correlation between individual measurement from each person. So this is practically modeling for the fact that some people have profile quite low. For the, those people the value di will be small or negative and people who have the value of di positive or large optic nerve head they will be here. Okay. And then once we fitted this model, um, we would know what is the uh, we would know what is the probability of seeing a particular cup to disk profile, the 24 numbers, given the fact that person has glaucoma or not. But that's not what we want. That's not what clinicians want or patients. They want the other uh, around. They want to know what is the probability of glaucoma, given that I see a particular profile. So we're using Bayesian principles particularly empirical bias, we then, and using this formula here, we then turn this around and we were able to find out the posterior probability of glaucoma 
given that I see a particular cup to disk profile of 24 numbers. And that's actually mimicking the thinking of our brain. Our brain is Bayesian. When we see a patient coming into our room and see we see the age of the person, we already have some prior probability in our head what the person what can be the probability of glaucoma of that person or of his eyes. But then once we see the image, we update this probability to get a posterior probability once we see the image or the CDR profile. So this is just a classical statistical table which shows that there is a significant association between the group, which is the having or not having glaucoma, and uh, the appearance of the cap to disc ratio profile of 24 numbers, so that's significant. But the significance is only a only a necessary condition of whether we can discriminate, but it may not be sufficient condition. It's only necessary. So once we confirm the association, we then look at how well we can actually uh, tell whether a person or I has a glaucoma given we see a particular cup to disc profile. Meaning we used um, this formula here, the posterior probability. And we simply say that if this posterior probability is above certain threshold, then we conclude or propose that this is glaucoma. And if it is below this profile, we conclude it is healthy. The idea is that this posterior probability is based not only on the height of that profile, but also on the shape. So here are the results from internal validation. By internal validation, we mean we use data from uh, origa, uh, these are data from Singapore of 650 eyes. We split it into two halves. One half of the data was used to do the segmentation, the automated segmentation. And then also the same half was also used to figure out the posterior probability of glaucoma, the rule, okay? And, and also fit the spatial statistical model of that curvature, okay? And then the other half, 325 eyes, have been used to test how well, how good is this posterior probability or this discriminatory rule, okay? And uh, this is the area, this is the receiver operating curve where on x-axis you have specificity, on y-axis you have sensitivity, and this diagonal means that if my plot is here, it means that my plot is no better than flipping a coin when patient arrives, okay? What I want is I want to have very high specificity close to one and also very high sensitivity again close to one. So I want my curve to be as close to one as possible. So our curve is quite close to one, but one can argue that this is only internal validation, which means uh, the data set from Singapore was split into two halves and uh, one half was used for training and one half was used for testing and calculating this receiver operating curve. So we also did external validation where we use data from Origa to find these boundaries, to train the algorithm to find the boundaries, like the algorithm that Brian described. And also we calculated these profiles for each of the eyes. And then this was, this was tested on data from RIM1, which is data that come from Canarian Islands. These profiles now don't look as beautiful as before. There is much more wiggliness, much more noise, which is quite expected because you have suddenly data from a different part of the world. This is different population of patients. They may have cameras uh, calibrated a bit differently. There may be other noise that may have arised when they were acquiring these pictures. And also when we then tested the algorithm on these patients from RIM1, this curve is now worse than before. This is now only 91% around the curve, which is still uh, quite high and very promising, but it is smaller. And this is always expected that the curve will get smaller as you are validating on external data set. Also a very good thing to see is that this algorithm provides probability of glaucoma, which is, um, 
in a classical sense, when the value is zero, it means algorithm thinks that actually there is a zero probability for that particular i. So for example, there are here four i's who are truly glaucomatic, glaucomatose. However, the algorithm thinks that they are not, and the rest of the glaucomatose eyes algorithm gives probability of one. These blue ones are the ones that are healthy, and these green ones are the ones that in Riemann data set were indicated or flagged as suspicious. Um, what I would like to next go is to say, I presented one algorithm. I mean, Brian started and I uh, finished the, uh, the description of this algorithm, but there are actually two principal types of AI algorithms for glaucoma that use fundus photograph. They are the ones where um, segmentation is not required, meaning they are not segmenting out the cup and disc. They directly use the image. They figure out the discrimination and they just tell you whether it is glaucoma or not. They also can give you a number between zero and one on continual scale, which may or may not have interpretation of glaucoma, but always zero would means that actually this is healthy and one means this is glaucoma. Um, this approach, Brian also mentioned this, is a black box approach because um, with this approach involves an algorithm which may have between 100,000 to actually several millions of parameters. So it's very hard to see how and why it works, although there is a research on figuring out why and how the algorithms like this do work. And the only algorithms at the moment who can do this are deep learning algorithms. So they are very powerful. There is another set of algorithms that you will see in published papers. And those algorithms are algorithms where segmentation is required or is done. So they would start with image. They would do some image preprocessing like um, the blurring, improving the, the image or even cutting it into smaller size and then there will be some segmentation done automatically, okay, like Brian has explained. And then there may be several steps here, one or several steps like we did, after which it will tell you whether it is glaucoma or not, okay. So there is a quite large number of papers being published. It is a very intensive area of research as we speak. And the way to make um, some sense of all these papers and the way how I approach these papers is to see is to first figure out okay do they do segmentation first or do they not and then if they do segmentation first how many steps they are there and how it is done so the algorithms where segmentation is not required I will just mention two examples is one is from uh, American Academy of Ophthalmology by Lee et al group um, so what they did, they used a deep learning algorithm. They achieved very high area under the curve, which is 98.6%, very high sensitivity and specificity. Um, they used 48,000 images. So this is quite large number. Okay. It is not surprising for a deep learning algorithm to use this many images, but this is one of the important characteristics is that they do need much more images in order to make sense of the images without doing the segmentation. However, when you read paper closer, you will see that in fact, they only use 39,000 images, 39,745, because uh, some images didn't meet the quality. And this is uh, the, this is the architecture of how they did the classification, okay? The other paper that I will mention is by uh, Christopher and a group uh, from 2018 from scientific reports. They again had a very high area under the curve. Again, they only use color fundus photographs and, uh, but they used less amount of images that was 14,822. Okay, so this gives a very good hope that there is information in the color fundus photographs, but that that this needs a very careful approach to figure out how to do it. So the algorithms where the segmentation of cup and disk is required, um, 
they can either go from image to segmentation and then there is only one step where the glaucoma is confirmed or not. And I would mention paper by group De V from 2018. So they do segment, but then they apply a deep learning algorithm to automatically give you whether it is glaucoma or not. Or you can do the segmentation and then you, from these segmented uh, curves, you can further do another feature extraction and then you do classification. The simplest feature extraction would be just to use these segmented areas to give you the vertical cup and disc ratio, okay? And we all know that accuracy is around 60 to 70%, okay? Or you can add to this vertical cup to disc ratio, you can also add other features, okay? And um, other features would be, for example, uh, the whole area of the disc and the whole area of the cup or ratio of the two. The other approach would be approach that I just described that what we did in Liverpool, and that is once you uh, uh, segment, then you extract the features by features. We extracted those profiles of 24 numbers. We modeled those 24 numbers using the model of 12 parameters. And from that model, we derived a classification. So that's, an, that's another thing what I do when I read papers is to figure out, okay, how many steps there are, there are and are they really sequential steps? And now finally, pros and cons of these two approaches, approach without and with the segmentation. Um, the first of all is the interpretation and explainability. If you have AI algorithm that also show the boundaries of cup and disk, then of course there is uh, the advantage of showing the patient or the clinician uh, that particular eye and saying, yeah, you can see from the segmentation that is a narrowing. Okay, you can explain to the patient why the algorithm is saying that he has or does not have glaucoma. Um, if the algorithm, however, the algorithm that I mentioned that we did in Liverpool contains several steps, six steps, and each of these steps um, comes with certain assumptions. And of course, there is more um, space to make an error. So we need to be very careful how we do all these six steps. But then of course, at the end, we can have an algorithm that now has a requirement of having less number of patients and also is an algorithm that provides interpretation and explainability. So it's a kind of working out uh, what we value the most uh, and to understand that every algorithm has its pros and cons. Now, how many assumptions are made when we construct the algorithm? As I mentioned, deep learning algorithms likely come with less amount of assumptions. Uh, when you have algorithm that has more steps, you need to make some assumptions as you go. So for example, when modeling the curves, we made assumption that when the patient is healthy, uh, the curve is mimicking um, an ellipse in the Cartesian space, okay? Um, now, how hard is to build a classifier? The classifier that requires segmentation, that can require also some time consuming considerations like um, Brian mentioned, especially uh, very lo lots of considerations how to segment out the cup, which is pretty, very much still uh, extensive area of research. And also important consideration for pros and cons as to what algorithm you want to go with is how much data is needed for the algorithm. Um, deep learning algorithms, uh, they require lots of hyperparameter tuning, um, a large number of parameters. They require larger sample size of, um, of order 10,000. Whereas when you do segmentation, you need less amount of data, less amount of images, but then in, you not only need to tell which image belongs to glaucoma or not, or suspicious, but you also need to give another type of annotation. You need to also tell where the boundaries are so that um, these boundaries together with the annotation, whether it is glaucoma or not, this then goes into training so the algorithm can be trained. So those are the things that we need to think about. And I will just conclude there are various types of algorithms that are being developed and being published. They can be 
the best, the simplest categorized on whether they do or do not require cup and disc segmentation. It's good to understand the pros and cons of each type. We still do not fully understand these pros and cons. I just started uh, some discussion on those and uh, this is still quite area of research. And what I didn't mention, and I would like to still say that there are also other algorithms that are based on other type of data like uh, optical coherence tomography and also visual fields. And I will stop here. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Gabriela. That was very comprehensive. Not all the talk starting from uh, uh, what are the approaches and then uh, finishing with some of the difficulties. And we know it's not an uh, easy uh, problem glaucoma to detect by AI. You no, know? and then I'm sure there's a lot of work happening with visual fields and OCT. And if we try to combine all these three together, we have something which is kind of uh, more robust than one segment. Is that right? What do you feel about that? Is that the future? Uh, this is what I feel is the future. Uh, this is what I feel that we there is still no full understanding how much OCT and how much uh, color fundus photographs information have about um, glaucoma. Um, Brian, you did look in some of these. Yeah, so if we, I would say at the present time, certainly fundus imaging is um, the, the key modality to investigate and try to combine the individual features that we can see. I think that's the current step that we need to take. Um, there is a lot of interest, especially from me, in investigating OCT um, as well, but that's at a much earlier stage. So that has limitations um, in terms of we're not 100% we're not sure of what exactly information we can get out of this. Um, and also in terms of the potential impact of OCT, so not everybody has it. Yeah. So uh, is there any question from the panelists? who are uh, joining us today. If you have any questions, you can unmute and ask the question. Uh, one hmm. question, uh, Vengadesh. Yes, sir. You know, so one question is, uh, uh, I mean, is there any studies based on the depth, assessing the depth of the cup? Something, you know, as human eyes, it's very difficult to visualize. Is there any, any studies that have been done using 3D photography or uh, stereoscopic fundus photography and then people have looked at the depth of the cup to understand that you know, because it's difficult for us to do it but if it is going to be done using artificial intelligence it should be possible so is there any anything has been done on that aspect or not Brian? there's certain I'm not aware of any that have tried to assess glaucoma from the depth of, specifically from the depth of the optic cup. There's certainly recent work on trying to estimate the 3D profile. Um, so trying to build a 3D profile of the optic cup purely from fundus, imi fundus stereoscopic images so that can be investigated. Okay. Brian, what about, uh, we are all talking only about the optic nerve head, but what about around the optic nerve head? Peripapillary atrophy, nerve fiber layer defect, now, if you have something which is looking around, we may mm -hmm. still pick up in a better way, right? The sensitivity and specificity can still go up. Absolutely. So this is, I think this is the current focus of looking at, so I mean, our, pri our primary objective for looking at fundus imaging is that it's, um, it's more widespread and it's, uh, I'm not sure if it's cheaper than OCT at the moment. Um, but focusing on the optic disc is the starting point. What we want to be able to do is to look around, to look at, um, uh, to look at pathologies like notches, like uh, peripapillary atrophy, and that should help us a lot um, in increasing the sensitivity and the specificity further. The limitation that we always have is in terms of data. So in the case of machine learning models, what you need um, is sufficient annotated data um, to train your models, and you can't do much until you have that. Um, and in terms of any other model, what you always need is validation. So it's a question of um, acquiring a, a good quality, well annotated data set so that we can start to develop this. And then I'm sure that it will improve the sensitivity and specificity of the model once we can factor these features in. Yes, uh, Dr. Kim. Oh, uh, thank you, Gabriela, again. Uh, I was just wondering, have you looked at uh, using the OCT, the nerve fiber layer uh, changes 
and comparing it with the fundus photos and see how it works just by looking at the fundus photos. I haven't. No. Is that um, something that's possible? I think that should be possible. It depends on um, whether there are data for that. And that should be possible to do. I mean, the, the algorithms that we show where we model the shape of the cup and disc ratio, the modeling can be also done on 3D from OCT. And that will be very interesting venue to explore. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Please. I, I have one question, a basic question, because uh, normally, you know, you have so much of variation about the size and shape of the disc and also the cup and the depth of the cup. Yeah, no, no uh, two glaucoma specialists agree for anything. <laughs> Hello? No, no, no two glaucoma specialists will agree for the cupping, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> So that's, that's, why, that's why AI people are still confused. Like people like Gabriel now who haven't worked with glaucoma after they started. <laughs> what no, is happening? How far, how far it will be reliable? What percentage of uh, thing we can uh, take it as reliable with uh, AI in glaucoma? Gabriel, it's a kind of broad question, but I think you answered in your talk. Do you want to add anything? Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I did not understand the question. Question is, if uh, there is no good agreement even between two or three senior glaucoma specialists, now how will you bring an agreement in AI? Yes, um, that's a problem in other disciplines too, uh, in imaging, for example. Um, and the statisticians, they do work on how do you actually evaluate accuracy of an algorithm, of an AI algorithm or any other mathematical algorithm, if there is no uh, perfect reference standard. Um, yeah, I mean, the only way to do is to try try to make the reference standard as good as possible. Um, so there are yeah, isn't it? questions. Yeah. Yes. Yes, please. Somebody ask. Yeah. Oh, sorry, that was me. Um, so, yeah, so I think this is a, an interesting question, and it's one that often comes up in, in ophthalmology in almost every field. Something as um, seemingly obvious as uh, trying to trace the knee in an X-ray image, which seems like a very easy task that can that, that to do. If you give it to, to two different clinicians who are expert, they will trace different areas. Um, so it's a major research area is trying to reach um, a consensus when you have multiple annotations. And this is really why having these uh, multiple annotations are so important. Um, so it's already a challenge to get um, annotated data, particularly in terms of segmentation, where it takes uh, maybe 15, 30 minutes to actually do the analysis and to do, to do the, the, the markup um, on the imaging data. But what we need to do is go beyond that and look at um, annotations. And then there are various ways that we can try to incorporate that. So we can look at um, the variability. So one thing that people like to say is that artificial intelligence works better than a human. Well, if your human is your gold standard, how can you tell that? Um, so what we aim to do is to have lower variability within the artificial intelligence than the humans have between each other. Yeah, that's, the, that's another big challenge here. Yeah. So okay. Uh, but uh, one thing that I wanted to add with that, um, you know, the question which R.K. and Klaast was, you know, again, uh, as my, uh, uh, as Dr. Inkeri also mentioned, so, you know, different glaucoma specialists look at, uh, uh, you know, different features in a fundus image to come to a conclusion. Uh, but the uh, interesting part about AI is at least, you know, the, uh, the black box method, uh, which is classically used, is uh, we don't mention what exactly the AI model should look at in the image. So it figures out on its own. Uh, it looks, it might even look at cup, disc, notch, RNFL defect, or any part of the fundus image, uh, which, um, you know, we are um, blind at this point on what exactly it's looking at. Uh, you know, in future research, if, you know, people are able to figure out how, what exactly is the deep learning model is looking at, you know, even, uh, you know, doctors could get uh, new uh, areas of fundus images where you can identify glaucoma a lot easier. Uh, because AI models are able to detect, you know, um, uh, glaucoma out of fundus images. So it's looking at, you know, certain features, uh, which, not, which not, might not be the same as doctors, but uh, it, it could be similar as well. 
This is a very good point because there is a research to find out where AI is looking or the what part of image is actually being used the most in order to derive the particular diagnosis. And that's something yeah, that I didn't are, mention. Yeah. Yeah, that is a, that is actually a really really good point. Um, so there's a and there's several techniques. So one of them would is uh, class activation maps. And the idea is that once you have your decision, um, you can develop a method for trying to to look at what the the model was focusing on. So if you do, for example, diabetic retinopathy, you might um, feed your image back through, and you'll see that microaneurysms get highlighted, and the vasculature gets highlighted. But what you tend to see is a huge amount of the vasculature gets highlighted. Um, and you don't have, so it, it's helpful information, but there's not necessarily contextual information. So you don't know why the vasculature is highlighted. And in the case of glaucoma, of course, what will be high, well, what I hope will be highlighted is the optic disc. But what does that mean? It just says that the optic disc is relevant at the moment. So there is a lot of work going on to, uh, at the moment in terms of making more sense of this data and um, a crucial area for research at the moment um, that we're working in is the interpretability and explainability of these artificial intelligence models. Yeah. Okay, there are a few questions. I think, Gabriela, you can also see on the chat box, uh, is there any AI which you know which is already incorporated into a fundus camera? I think this is more like a commercial question. You know, like we know that some of the DR modules are already into fundus cameras. Uh, are you aware of anything, any commercial ones or uh, ones which are already being used? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not uh, aware. Yeah, there was a one UK based company, right? Uh, 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 what, what, what are they called? Uh, Krishna, what, what is the company that who already had a... But they don't make fundus cameras. No, no, but they are already in market. No, they, yeah. they have AI for glaucoma. Uh, is it the peak camera? No, no, no. Uh, Gabriela, the one you men is mentioning the is the AI, AI company. The ah. Pegasus system by Visualtics, probably. Yeah, Visualtics, yeah. Uh, ah, Visualtics, Visualtics, correct. Uh, but yeah. uh, uh, but yeah. to answer that question, uh, if there is, I think, a few fundus cameras which is coming up with just the cup to disc segmentation marking. Uh, if I, I personally worked with Remedio to do that, but uh, there's a lot of you know big companies which are doing the segmentation part of it inbuilt in the fundus cameras uh, today. I, I'm, I'm not I'm not able to answer the exact you know uh, companies which are doing it, but uh, uh, I've heard few um, fundus expensive fundus cameras have inbuilt uh, segmentation models coming in okay. uh, recently. Mm -hmm. So the next question is about the, the cams. I'm sure uh, we, we don't have any module available, but once it's there, I'm sure it will be the ones which would be really working in outreach, vision centers, you know, where you, you don't have the ophthalmologist to interpret some of these images. Uh, uh, so the, the third question is again, again, all these challenging situations, like where you have high myopia, all those optic nerve which are quite abnormal, Will is, is it going to work? Is it always a debatable question, right, Gabriela? It is a debatable question. Um, um, that is something that needs to be tested, really. It's uh, it's impossible to tell now. Exactly. You need more data on myopic eyes and tilted disc, you know, unless we have yeah. that, it's very difficult to say. Yeah. Uh, there are some algorithms where if part of the image of the optic nerve head is missing, the algorithms it is important to figure out how these algorithms work okay. if image is lower quality or some part is in missing because of, for example, cataract. So there's one question from uh, Divya, uh, I think who's also really working on AI. How did the Cartesian system perform in early glaucoma versus late? Considering that many early glaucoma changes show very subtle changes in the optic disc, yeah. especially early NTGs where only disc hemorrhage may be visible. Yeah, we don't know this yet. That's something that needs to be investigated because we didn't know uh, for the images that we had, we didn't know how early was the glaucoma. What about physiological cupping, which is no, it's, it's not uncommon. We keep seeing big disc with big cup. Uh, what is your thoughts on that? How does your algorithm work? And is your algorithm? Hmm. I'm not sure really. Uh, I didn't think about it. I would need to think. 
anybody else wants to add brian krishna i say because you you have seen a lot of people with normal physiological cups who have a big big disc with big cups um, i mean he could he could detect as glaucoma because it's 0.7 or 0.8 but it's kind of physiological yeah especially in your cartesian system when you are looking at the shape of the disc in the cup and in physiological cupping you might have large cups how would it perform in such a situation <laughs> Yeah, this is something that especially um, given that yes. the optic disc size uh, would come into play in such such images, and yeah. um, the cupping in larger discs is considered normal, so disc size would become important. So, is mm. there a way that this is factored in in the system to look at disc size, or is there another algorithm looking at the disc size? Uh, yeah. So this is uh, this. I mean, this is an issue that um, that we know about that we've considered. Um, it's not factored in at the moment into this particular algorithm, so we don't know. Um, we haven't quantified just how it would cope with that. With the project that we've got, um, hopefully about to start, um, that we well, that we've started working on already. Um, we're working to quant to build in more factors um, into the into the model, and one of those is disk size. Yeah, it's actually very interesting that you asked. It. We actually discussed it yesterday as to you know see if we could include the area of the disk in the cup into our uh, algorithm. Mm -hmm. Do you think with an AI, um, uh, is it possible to actually dis um, be able to detect a disk size or be able to measure a disk size on a two D image? Considering that getting stereoscopic images are very hard, um, is there is there a possibility that the, a disk size could be measurable on a 2D image? So, do you mean from, sorry, uh, for, do you mean from monoscopic or from stereoscopic? Not, not stereoscopic. Not stereoscopic. On 2D, yeah, on a two-dimensional image. There okay. is, there, there's potential, certainly. Um, so you can measure disk size, but it is up to um, the, the the orientation, say, um, of the of the monoscopic image. So what you're always seeing is this single plane that you have, and it may well be that it's at an angle, it's rotated, so that it would be um, maybe not quite so accurate. There is a lot of research in trying to. So I mean, one uh, approach for this would be to begin with stereoscopic imaging and trying to estimate the 3D profile, and then you could measure quite accurately. There's a lot of research, um, particularly in terms of face recognition. Um, I have a side, a side project for hand recognition, um, where we're trying to estimate the 3D profile based on single monoscopic images um, in the data. And that should lend itself very well to the, um, to the optic disk profile problem. So right. it's, I guess the other issue would be magnification too, considering that different images come with different magnifications. Yeah, I mean, this is where actually, if you're, if you're, I mean, if you're using something like the Peak or the DI, um, or one of these handheld camera, the ha cameras that has a very small field of view, and you can only get the optic disc, then it's really challenging. Um, you can make an estimate maybe using the, uh, the, the size of the vasculature as a comparison, mm -hmm. um, or some sort of any other feature that you can find. But again, it's an estimate. Um, what we often use um, in full, say, uh, fuller field um, fundus imaging is we use the localization of the fovea and the optic disc. And we know that this should be, is I think it's four and a half optic disc diameter right. Um, right. from them. So we, we tend to use that for scale. Okay. Okay, thanks. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll take one last question, uh, Brian and Gabriela, before we close the session today. There's one on the question and answer. What is the software used for generating the graphs and what is the difference between internal and external validation? I think it's for Gabriela again. Okay. Software used for generating the graphs. You mean the receiver operating characteristic graphs? Um, uh, I think so. I'm not sure. Probably. So the software that I used was R the software R, capital R, and the internal external validation. So by internal validation, we meant um, having data from Singapore, splitting it into two halves, using one half to train the segmentation and also the classification, and then use the other half to see how good is that classification. So that will be internal validation. Because you by validation, we always mean um, answering the question of how accurate is the algorithm and whether this algorithm is generalizable 
uh, outside of the data set. Okay. Um, if you do validation, you can do two types, internal and external. Internal, we typically only do when we only have one data set and no other data set from the world. Okay. Um, so internal validation will tell you how internally the data will look if you test, if you train it on one set of patients and then you test it on another set of patients, but these patients come from the same hospital, same population. This, however, doesn't tell you how this will work externally in other part of the world. Yes. And by doing these validations, uh, it must be done this way because you cannot have the same data set, same set of patients used both for training and testing, because then the area under the curve, the all estimates of accuracy will be bloated. They will be over, um, over, they will be overly estimated. They will be positively biased up. Yeah, that will be the full answer. Okay. So l one last question. So if it's not available in a camera now, no, like Krishna was trying to say that there are some big companies who already have segmentation into their cameras. How do we apply this software? This is for the future, right? You want to answer this, uh, Brian? Yeah, so um, that is one very big question, actually. Um, so at the moment, we are in the, the research stage in terms of our own software. Um, and there's still, there's quite, quite a lot of validation um, that we need to do um, before I would um, comfortably um, release any software, um, certainly for triaging or for, for diagnosis. Um, and there's a couple of approaches that can be considered depending on what is suitable. A part of um, a project that we've got coming up is to determine the most suitable way and the most effective way um, of actually implementing it. So some people um, like the idea of having this in sort of mobile app, um, which may be very useful in terms of the peak cameras. And that's one of the, the key challenges as well is trying to downscale this kind of model so that it can actually be evaluated on a mobile phone. And this is one of the areas that, uh, that we're interested in. Um, a lot of people talk about this idea of having uh, remote clinics, so having a website maybe, so you take the front of this image and you upload it to this website and get your decision. Um, and I think the, mo uh, the, the most suitable way will depend on the hospital. There will be a number of ways. So I suppose the most efficient would be to have it built into the device. So you take your front of this image and instantly you have your diagnosis. Um, but then for other situations like uh, where they have reading centers where they want to collate this information, it may work better as a software application. Um, so that's really a part of a much wider, um, a big discussion um, that is taking place. Thank you. Thank you, Brian and Gabriela again. Uh, next week on uh, July uh, 16, we have a very interesting topic again, how to read and understand some of the AI papers. I think it's, it's more technical, but uh, for people who are in, in AI and interested in AI, it will be a great talk. So uh, don't miss that session, which is going to be next Thursday at same time between 5 to 6 p.m. Thank you again, and we'll end this session. Thank, Thank you. you.